I wanted to open this space with um, just to take some time to think about the fact that we ourselves are on um, Seneca land and that um, everybody who has ancestors that chose to come here, um, we are also settlers. So it's important to um, consider all aspects of occupation and colonialism when we organize around this work. So Safe by challenging white supremacy that is at the root of anti-Semitic rhetoric and activity. Moreover, it is hypocritical that Congress members condemn Omar's non-existent anti-Semitism while staying silent on the actual harassment and death threats that Representative Omar has been receiving nonstop as a black Muslim woman, the first to serve in Congress in a hijab. Let's stand together with Ilhan Omar and focus on the real threat, growing white supremacist danger to the safety of Jewish people, Muslim people, black people, people of color, and immigrants. Yep. Yes? Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, JVP Rochester, for organizing this rally in support of Ilhan Omar, her unapologetic stance on American foreign policy, which includes the long-term human rights catastrophe that is Israel-Palestine, and in support of the clear language she has used to open up this conversation in a way that's never been done in American politics before. I want to talk a little bit more about language. George Orwell understood the power of language, how it is essential to human thought, because it provides the structure and limits to what we can think and articulate. Many words such as settler colonialism, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, or sometimes even occupation can be used in conversations about Israel-Palestine. We can not talk about the Israel lobby, the use of propaganda, or support nonviolent movements such as BDS that aim to pressure Israel into adhering to international law. Yes. We've seen from the recent attacks on Mark Lamont Hill, Michelle Alexander, and Angela Davis that free speech on Palestine, the naming of names, and the listing of facts is punishable in America, particularly, it seems, if one is a person of color. Talking about color or racism against people of color, I have to break down a cultural meme related to Ilhan Omar, to the Ilhan Omar controversy. I'm sorry for its absurdity, but I think it exposes the underbelly, the mechanisms which make it possible to unleash national furor against someone like Omar. I'm talking about Megan McCain sobbing on national TV because even though she's not Jewish, she's friends with Joe Lieberman, and she finds what Omar is saying very dangerous. Here is a privileged white woman, the daughter of a senator and so-called imperial war hero, a conservative who believes that supporting Trump's wall is not necessarily racist, calling a refugee, a survivor of war, a black Muslim woman scary. In fact, she attacked Omar's identity for fitting into too many boxes because it was forcing the Democratic Party to support her intersectionality. This switching of places with a woman of color by assigning Omar her own power and imagining herself as a preemptive victim is exactly the kind of thinking that makes Israel bomb Gaza as an open air prison on a regular basis. It's the kind of thinking that sees Palestinian children as a demographic threat. There is this inversion of truth that is quite breathtaking. It's also the logic behind America's war on terror, such that a country like Afghanistan, the second poorest country in the world, where malnutrition is rampant, becomes a threat to the life and security of well-fed, well-heeled Americans, and a justification for occupation. Writer and activist Sean King compares Megan McCain's blubbering and her declaration that Ilhan Omar is very scary to Jennifer Schultz, the white woman who called the police on a couple of black men grilling some food at a park in Oakland. It's white fragility gone mad, which I think explains a lot of the vicious hatred directed at Omar. And perhaps this could be a clarifying lens we can use to separate anti-Semitism from other things. When anti-Semitism is used as a rallying cry for white supremacy, or any kind of supremacy, whether it's here in the US or in England or in Israel, then we have to look at those accusations more closely. When anti-Semitism is used to mask the, the diversity within Jewish communities, 
because the vast majority of Jews agree on this, or 98% of Jews were hurt by that, then that's the sort of state-sponsored conversation we need to debunk. Any work against anti-Semitism cannot be aligned with white supremacy, with the Trumps and Megan, uh, Megan McCain's of this world, or the liberals who embrace soft racism and soft Islamophobia. The irony of the Ilhan Omar controversy is that you have white people, for the most part, spewing venom at a black woman for mentioning dual allegiance, words that she did not use, by the way, and in the same breath accusing her of dual allegiance. She's from Africa, she's Muslim, she wears the hijab. Is she American enough? Or does she represent those who attacked us on 9-11? How can some tropes be more acceptable than others? As Ayanna Presley said, there is no hierarchy of hurt. Which brings me back to language. When every effort to end physical pain, to end actual wars on bodies, is ensconced in words that are, that are deemed harmful or unacceptable, then how does one activate for change? How does one stop murderous wars and occupations? Palestinian poet Remy Kanazi tweeted on March 6th, as Ilhan Omar is smeared this week, this is happening in Palestine. Israel cuts off water supply for 2,600 Palestinians. Israel bombs Gaza. Israel bans call to prayer in Ibrahimi Mosque. Israeli army shoots a child. Israeli settlers attack a school for the 11th time. This is the reality we are facing. This is the kind of hurt we must stop. Thank you. So thank you everybody for coming out. I, I just want to say that this subject kind of hits home. Um, I mean, it, it, it's literally hitting home. As a Palestinian American and as a daughter of an immigrant who came straight from Palestine in 1991, who was actually fleeing the occupation and fleeing the separation of her family and trying to find a better life for her children out here, um, it, it's, it's one of the most detrimental things um, that we could see happening in the United States democracy. So this isn't new. We know that this conversation has been silenced. And I can actually share that based on my everyday life. Anytime that I mention to somebody, when they ask me who I am and where I'm from, and I acknowledge that I am Palestinian, people already become incredibly uncomfortable with the situation. They automatically think I'm trying to get political. They automatically think I'm trying to talk about terrorism. And it shows me that the subject itself is so incredibly misunderstood. And it shows me that while dialogue, we are far, we should be far beyond dialogue, Dialogue is the most important thing when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And when we're being silenced and our First Amendment rights are being told that they are, un they are, um, they are anti-Semitic, they are wrong. It is unconstitutional to try and condemn the voices of the Palestinian people and those who are trying to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian community. From the anti-BDS legislation that's been introduced in New York State, to the executive order that's been tried to be portrayed by Governor Cuomo, to all the other bills we see across the country, it is outright unconstitutional to silence the voices of those who stand in solidarity with the Palestinian community. We are better than that. And we stand in front of the federal building today because we call on people like Joe Morelli to take a position on something like this and reminding everyone out there that they cannot silence the voices of the, of, of the minority. They cannot silence my voice, and they cannot silence the voices of my family. They didn't have to get their families separated by the Israeli Defense Forces. My own uncles have been pulled from their homes in the middle of their sleep just to be interrogated. Things have been taken out of people's homes in Palestine, and we're being told we can't talk about it? The United, United Nations is right now looking to see if the killings of children in Gaza are actually legitimate or not, when this has been happening for decades. It's not the time right now to silence the voices of the people, especially as we're trying to find as much information as possible about the issue and bringing it into the West. For those who are Palestinian and those who have actually dealt with this, for those who are Israeli and standing in solidarity with the Palestinian community, I really, really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart that you are trying so hard to, fall, to, to, to get on top of this. So thank you all. Um, and it's so important to call on your legislators to take a position on this. Right now there are bills that still exist. We need to condemn those bills. We need to remind them that they are unconstitutional and we have every right, just as Ilhan Omar does, to speak up about the issue. Thank you. Hi, so this is largely speaking to my fellow uh, American Jews. I need towards Yona, but shut for the water, Gittel, but I need Yehudi, America. 
I am a proud diaspora too. Today, the definition of anti-Semitism seems to be a hot topic. Who gets to make a definition? Is it based on what some scholar published or what you personally take offense to? But there's 6.5 million Jews here in the US and another 8 million elsewhere. So we have at least that many different opinions. Let me share a few of mine. Anti-Semitism is what drove my great-grandparents to seek out a new life in this country. It's the reason I don't know what my last name should be. Or talk louder. Only an anglicized version of it. Anti-Semitism is the history of local leases and clubs with bylaws outlying Jewish participation. Anti-Semitism is laced through the portrayal of witches and goblins in your favorite fantasy stories. Anti-Semitism is friends getting pennies thrown at them in the schoolyard. It's being told, you don't look like a Jew, as if we all are supposed to come in easily identifiable packages. And as if that's a compliment, anyway. Anti-Semitism is Christianity being considered America's default and efforts to degrade the separation of church and state. It is public spaces being defaced with swastikas and neo-Nazi propaganda. It is prominent officials referencing the elders of Zion. It is dog whistles like globalists or cultural Marxism. It is Holocaust denial. Anti-Semitism is also contextual. Like any other systemic form of oppression, it requires nuance to decipher. Analysis of a person's remarks requires a broader look into their frame of reference. There is no inherent anti-Semitism in a human rights advocate highlighting inhumane governmental actions. There is no inherent anti-Semitism in an outspoken critic of the weight of money in politics, criticizing a Goyish congressman for being influenced by PAC money. There is no inherent anti-Semitism in questioning American allegiance to foreign regimes. And reading the broader context of Representative Omar's tweets, I don't believe that she is anti-Semitic at all. Her actions have shown her to be an intersectionally progressive leader, fueled by his desire to make the world a better place, to do tikkun olam. None of us are really that tuned into the experiences of a marginalized group that we don't belong to. Every day, I learn the problematic implications of something new. Nitpicking her phrasing, righteous anger over her fumbles with articulating real problems that lay dangerously close to anti-Semitic tropes is unproductive and misdirected energy. I am scared for this country. I am scared for our communities. I am terrified by the rise of white nationalism in all of its forms, from the politically accepted Confederate enthusiasts and the alt-right to blatant Nazi sympathizers. There's an overwhelming presence of hateful ideology in all corners of this country. If I were to take this national outrage about anti-Semitism at face value, I would expect to have seen an even stronger response to blatant indecent incidents in the past few years. When neo-Nazis marched in the streets shouting, Jews will not replace us, and the sitting president refused to condemn their actions, where was this level of mobilization? When known white supremacists or sympathizers have been sitting at all levels of our government for years, how come it takes an offhand tweet from the first black Muslim refugee who made it to Congress for a national action to occur? We, young progressive Jews of America, see through this uproar for the smokescreen that it is. All of these conservative goyim calling for the ousting of Ilhan aren't truly concerned for our safety as a Jewish people. They have shown us time and again that we are only valued when we are useful, and I don't trust people who only care about my rights in certain situations, who weaponize my persecution only to make a point. There are more members of Kufi, the Christian Israel lobby, and there are Jews in the entire United States, so don't pretend that this is only a Jewish issue. The U.S. government has a vested interest in maintaining its relationship with the State of Israel for imperial, financial, and military reasons. Turning that relationship into an unquestionable and benevolent bond functions to distract us from moral issues, and banning legitimate criticism on claims of anti-Semitism employs the generational trauma of American Jews as a scapegoat. Criticism of Israel is not anti-Semitic. How can I pledge allegiance to a government promoting segregation and exclusion based on religion or ethnicity? Isn't that precisely what my ancestors fled from? We, the American Jewish community, need to do better. We need to hold ourselves to a higher standard. The joke goes that most of our holidays follow the same formula. They tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. In another month, we'll be celebrating the exodus. Our ancestors escaped from an oppressive and murderous regime. We celebrate the continuation of our peoplehood, the sacredness of cultural survival. To my Jewish family, I hope that you carry the spirit of this holiday within your hearts and apply its lessons to other groups of marginalized people suffering in similar ways today. We are intimately aware of the loss felt by expulsion, of unequal treatment by conquering governments, 
by the destruction of our homes and sacred sites, by the pain of being separated from family and community in order to survive. We know this pain, it is etched into our souls. This pain, our pain, will not go away by transferring it to another people. I reject a homeland created by uprooting any of its current residents. I reject any community that does not strive to give equal, equal rights to all of its members. Can you not recognize the pain and suffering in the eyes of another displaced people? Can you justify turning your back on your complicity in it? Two young Palestinian children died last week in a fire after emergency services weren't allowed across a military checkpoint. There are no equal rights, there is no equal access, and there is no end in sight. No amount of generational trauma gives us the right to oppress another people, and it is up to us, American Jews, to make that clear. My name is Torit Ziona, and the Israeli government does not represent me. I hope that we can move forward with a more nuanced understanding of anti-Semitism and unite to fight both for Palestinian rights and against white supremacy. Toda v'shalom. Uh, working on this event, I've been thinking about the first rally I ever helped organize in Rochester. Inc incidentally, it's when I first met Mara Ahmed. Um, it was a rally against anti-Semitism. A dozen graves at a Jewish cemetery in Greece had been smashed, toppled, and defaced. defaced. This has since happened at least two more times, each time with diminishing media attention. Um, a small crowd of us gathered a week later at 12 Corners in Brighton to come together and draw strength from one another. The crowd was largely Jewish people with a smattering of community activists whose support was invaluable, but the support I will never forget was the support from the Muslim community. Of course, Mars spoke as well as other Muslim and Jewish community members that day, we also found out that uh, the Henrietta JCC had received a bomb threat. Um, it was scary, but we were all together. In those moments, I realized on a truly visceral level what solidarity means and why it is so necessary. Solidarity means never being alone in the fight because our oppressions are truly intertwined. However, we as a Jewish com community need to clean our house before it is fit for guests. Uh, the depth of Islamophobia expressed in the Jewish community can be truly disturbing at times, most often expressed as anti-Palestinian and Zionist sentiment. And since so many Jewish institutions have made being a Zionist a prerequisite for participation and are so deeply plugged into funding the most right-wing right, right agendas of the State of Israel, U.S. Jews uncritically associate themselves with this pro project, completely erasing the long history of non- and anti-Zionist thought and organizing in the Jewish community historically. Um, and as, as Tori spoke to, um, some of the most, though this is something that's very prominent in the Jewish community, um, some of the most powerful funders are Christians. Um, but, but yeah, I guess, um, But yeah, so I think that even though it's important to point out that Christians and the U.S. government and um, and so many of these forces are are you know have are are wielding this control and steering what's happening with uh, with Israel, um, it's also important for us as Jews to come and take account for where our community is going. I know that there are a lot of Jews out there that are kind of on the fence. I know when I ask my parents about this issue, they will say, I don't know enough about it. I just don't know. Um, and even a lot of Jews will have that reaction um, in response to questions about Israel-Palestine. And um, I guess to those Jews, I really just want to say, things are being done in your name, whether you know enough about it or not. So. It's, it's really like, it's either things are gonna be done in your name without your knowledge of it, or you can take the time to, to say not in my name. And that's what we at Jewish Voice for Peace fight for. Um, you know, we, we fight for to say not in our name. We uh, fight as a community of allies with the Palestinian community, and we fight to reclaim our Judaism from these extreme ideological forces. So um, I'm a member of the local chapter of Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, we're here today to 
show our solidarity and support for Representative Ilhan Omar and her courageous stance for Palestine, and at the same time to de denounce the rising tide of white nationalism. As you'll see, we have growing support, so that's what's wonderful to see. And why is this an important issue? So, for Americans, it's a particularly important issue and one that we have a particularly strong connection to, whether people are familiar with Palestine and Israel or not. Um, the U.S. is by far the largest uh, supporter diplomatically, militarily, um, of the Israeli government's occupation of Palestine. People have been suffering, Palestinians have been suffering for years under Israeli occupation with land theft, home demolitions, um, arrests, and, and, and murder as well. So we're really here to try and, um, to one, show support for uh, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's courageous stance for Palestine, and also to really send a strong message to the general public and to our representatives, including Representative Morelli, that conflating Judaism with support for uh, Israeli state policy uh, is, is dangerous for both Jews and Palestinians alike. It deflects uh, criticism legitimate criticism of Israeli state policies of aggression towards the Palestinian people. And as Jews, uh, as, as Jews, that, that, you know, as Jews um, and allies here at this rally, we're here to say that uh, the Israeli government's occupation of Palestine is not in accord with our, with our values.